Malware Mondays, episode two is here. And in this episode, we're going to cover how to investigate processes using SysInternals Process Explorer and System Informer. This is a behind the scenes video for the live stream in which we'll cover how the artifact was made. One of my goals is to provide you with artifacts that are safe to handle while also mimicking real world malicious behaviors. And this week's sample is going to be a custom creation. In this video, we'll review the source code of the binary we're going to analyze, cover basic Windows API usage and get insights into how a program accesses additional resources and compile the program, which allows you to modify it for further learning. Before we get started, please take a moment and hit that like and subscribe button. Comments are open as well, so let me know what you think of this video. I'm headed to Vegas. Hacker Summer Camp is just around the corner and I've already started preparing. This summer, I'll be offering an intensive four-day course on advanced techniques for reverse engineering Windows malware. This hands-on course will equip security professionals with the advanced techniques needed to reverse engineer complex Windows malware using industry standard tools such as disassemblers, decompilers, and debuggers. Learn to bypass obfuscation, analyze hidden functionalities, and generate actionable threat intelligence to protect your organization. I hope to see you in Vegas, and please don't hesitate to reach out if you have any questions. Okay, let's get started. For this episode's program, as I mentioned, this is going to be a custom creation. You'll be able to find the source code on my Learning Malware Analysis repository on GitHub. Once there, you can navigate under Dynamic Analysis, Process Exploration, and here you'll find processexplorer.c. I hope the name makes sense. I really struggle with coming up with sensical names. So if you have any suggestions, please feel free to open up an issue or send me a message. Now for this program, the goal here is to identify certain behaviors by looking at the process as it's running in the operating system using a tool like Process Explorer. So I don't have necessarily a full featured program here but you're gonna find plenty of behaviors that are gonna be important to recognize as you learn to investigate the process. You're also gonna hopefully start to see between this episode and the last Malware Mondays, how having a tool like Procmon can really help connect the dots to be able to see a little bit deeper into the activity of the process as well as to capture that information more permanently. Now, for this video, I don't wanna get into all the details of C programming. I wanna point out, I'm also not a C programmer. I learn just enough through my analysis of malware and part of my desire to create these programs is really twofold. One is to share artifacts with you so that you don't have to worry about handling malicious malware, malicious binaries and malicious code. And then the other is just to deepen my understanding as well. I would encourage you to consider building upon these samples much as I have. Now to get started, we're gonna have some include statements for header files, as well as linking for different libraries that are gonna be utilized. The program will have a pretty standard structure to it. That is, we'll have our function prototypes here at the top. These are gonna be custom defined functions that I'm going to use in the program. We'll have some global data. Don't really need this global data, but likely what you'll see as we go through you know, future episodes, future Malware Monday episodes, I'm gonna utilize these programs and just continue to build off of them and then we'll investigate them using a variety of other tools. So for example, if when we get to the point where we wanna disassemble this program, it'll be important to understand the difference between these global variables and local variables. Okay, but for now, we're still focused on the basics. Okay, next is the main method. It identifies essentially the entry point where the author has started to write their code. At the beginning of this method then, we'll have our local variable declarations. So a couple of handles here, a handle for a mutex, um, a handle for a DLL, and you can just think of a handle at this point as uh, essentially a pointer to those particular objects. We also have a char array, and that essentially represents our strings. So if you're not real familiar with working with strings at a lower level, uh, this will help a little bit start to provide you that insight. I also have a void pointer. That is, this is going to be a pointer to memory but I'm not telling the compiler what is going to be stored in that memory. Uh, I'm gonna use it quite arbitrarily in this program. Okay, first thing this program is going to do, and we're gonna get into the actual capabilities of the program now. I would consider this a spoiler if you wanna look at the executable and investigate it with a fresh set of eyes. I like this approach when learning, 
because what you can do now is you can look at how these things are not only created in, in source code, but you have an understanding of what to look for now when you investigate the process using a tool like Process Explorer. For example, we're gonna create, one of the first things I do is create a mutex, and it's going to use the mutex name that was defined above. You now know that, and you know not only that it's gonna create the mutex, but exactly what that mutex name is. So when you look at this process with Process Explorer, you'll likely see other mutexes, and you'll be able to determine, or start to see, get that sense of what just the runtime and the operating system is doing and what is behaviors or indicators specifically by the malware um, or the program that you're analyzing. So hopefully that, that helps. So what is a mutex? Well, a mutex is used basically for synchronization. And how I'm using it in this instance in this program is just to simply prevent multiple instances of itself from running. Okay, if it's not able to get a handle to the mutex, then it's going to assume that the mutex is not there and would go down this path which is the main functionality. Otherwise, we scroll down, it closes the handle, if a handle is obtained, which will just essentially terminate or exit the program. If we go back to where the handle is checked, and let's say that uh, there is currently no mutex available. So one of the first things that's going to happen here is you'll see, and, and this was a Windows API call, I didn't mention that, um, but all of these are gonna be Windows API calls. So if you're not real familiar with the Windows API, that's gonna provide the primary layer between our program and its ability to uh, interact with the operating system. So Windows API call for Open Mutex, you're not sure what, what Open Mutex does, Microsoft has it defined on MSDN. Very similar with Create Mutex, right? And, and a lot of these API calls that you're going to see, they're all gonna be really fairly well defined on MSDN. So Create Mutex will do that, it'll create a Mutex, we're going to give it the mutex name, and this name can become then a potentially a really good indicator or a host-based indicator to look for on a system. You can investigate a system, look at the running processes, and if that process has the, you know a particular mutex that you're looking for, that might be one way to identify it. Now, the only other way to identify a mutex outside of the process be you know running and, and actually having had created the mutex is to look for that mutex value as a string. As you saw here, this mutex value that I'm going to use is a string value. Now, none of the strings in this program are obfuscated. And that goes to show how important the strings are. Future episodes will likely get into some string obfuscation, right? But for now, that's just one more of those little nuggets I want you to keep in the back of your head as we're going through these samples. Okay, continuing on is a call to get module file name. And what this is going to do is it's going to get the current location of the executable, the full path, and it's going to copy it into that, that character array, or, or essentially that string, that empty string that we defined above. Next, it's going to use the stir stir method to look for app data in that path. And essentially what I'm doing here is I'm just saying, if I'm not running in the user's app data folder, then, then that means that I've been executed likely from however I was dropped on the system or maybe where the user first encountered me and as an attachment to an email, which isn't as likely these days, um, or, or some other method, then it's gonna go ahead and do this, call this method, copy self persist, and pass that path to this function. So we can scroll down here, take a look at this. There's just a few things happening inside of this method then. We have some char arrays or strings to find above. Uh, the name of the program as it's going to be dropped on the file system. That means I'm going to copy its copy itself to a new location. You can see some telltale signs of registry key usage. Um, and in this case, and I say that because you have just this format um, and these values here that if you're not real familiar with, you, you will uh, the more malware that you analyze. Um, this one in particular is important because registry key, this registry provides a set of keys whose values are programs to run when the user logs into the system. So it's very common to see this particular key being utilized for persistence. Okay, we have a few more variables here. Um, and again, I'll, I'll let you analyze those in more detail if you'd like to. Uh, the, the, the gist of what this function is doing though, is it's calling get environment variable to expand the temp environment variable into this character array or the string, the environment path. So that's gonna get the, the full path to the user's temp directory. Usually that's something like C users, username, app data, local temp. 
Stir, stir our char is going to get the, and this is a backslash character. So it's going to get the last instance of the backslash. So essentially, this will be a pointer to the end of the string. That way, we can do a stir and cat, and we can concatenate the name, which you saw up above, flyingtoasters.scr. We can concatenate that name with the environment path. So that's going to give us a full absolute path now with a file name attached to it. Next, I'm going to see if the file already exists. If the file already exists, then that means we've already dropped ourselves to this new location. So we don't need to do it again. Assuming this is the first time that this program is executed on the host, though, it won't exist. And now we, we can call a couple more APIs to first use create file to get a handle to ourself, then create file again to get a handle to the new location, the location that we're going to copy to. So create file is one of those APIs. We talked about this in the last episode where it can be used to get a pointer to an existing file and also it can be used to create a new file. And in this case, you're going to be able to look at the arguments to get a better understanding, such as create new attribute here versus the open existing um, to better understand how create file is being utilized. Okay. Now, next, what it's doing is essentially going to read itself and then write itself to that new location. So for wherever it ran in the file system, get a handle to itself, read the entire contents of itself off of the disk, off of the hard drive, copy itself to a new location, and that'll be it. Next, we're going to add a little persistence. And one of the reasons that we're going to do this is you're going to see that this isn't going to be activity that we're going to be able to pick up with Process Explorer. That's, again, why tools like Process Monitor become very complementary. So we're going to use reg open key, reg set value, and reg close key, where we're going to open, go back up to the top here, and you'll see this path. We're going to add a new key called the Cyber Yeti, and its value, a little further here, its value is going to be the environment path, right? That location that we created just a little bit earlier in this function which was the user's temp directory and the appending of the flyingtoasters.scr file name. Okay, once that's done, it's going to create the process based off of that new location and then exit. And this is a very common activity that you'll see where malware will run. It'll do maybe some unpacking, some persistence, other behaviors, kind of like we're observing here, moving itself to a new location in the file system. That new location then might be where, it's, where it wants to persist, we set up our persistence here using the registry and that new location, and then launch that, that moved or copied instance of itself, and then exit. So you're going to see this here when we get into observing the behaviors with Process Explorer. Okay, so that's the persistence. Now if we go back and see what happens, right? Now when it's running, and it's running from that persisted location, app data will be part of the path, so we won't have to do the persistence again. Next thing is to, I just wanted to mimic some behaviors that you'll commonly see in malware. One is to run commands such as PowerShell commands to help you know, interrogate the environment or soften the environment by disabling antivirus or putting holes in the firewall. So shell execute is one way to do that. You'll see we're gonna run the PowerShell command and it's just gonna be a base64 encoded string. Um, you can decode that, you'll see. It's just a start sleep. I wanna keep things simple at this point. Next is to load a library. It's uh, also very common activity for malware to either have additional DLLs or to download them. And those downloaded DLLs could be modules or additional functionality. So we're gonna see how to simply load a library. In this case, it's going to already be on the system and it's really this demo DLL is gonna do nothing but pop a message box. Uh, but we'll see that loaded in the process space when we look at the process. I'm also going to allocate some memory using called a virtual alloc. Um, again, kind of an arbitrary thing. We just want, I just want a region of memory. It's going to be read, write, and execute. And we'll talk about looking at those permissions when we get into the live stream. And then this for loop is just simply copying the counter variable into that memory using memmove. And this will give us an opportunity here to talk a little bit about system informer versus process explorer. And how do we just look at the different regions of memory that were allocated in our process? Finally, there's a sleep call. 300,000 milliseconds or five minutes. So again, 
I don't want to get into anything too complex here because this is enough to exhibit a lot of the key behaviors and indicators that we look for when investigating the process. Okay, um, the last thing I want to point out, well, two last things, I guess. One is, first is if you want to compile it, you should be able to just open up the developer command prompt from Microsoft Visual Studio, CL, and then our process, or our, I'm sorry, our source code. So there you go. If you have any warnings or errors, those will be emitted right about there, and you'll need to address those. Otherwise, you'll get processexplorer.exe. So the name of our source code, now with just a .exe extension, you should be able to run it. Um, the last thing I want to point out is if you start to experiment with this, this program before the live stream, you'll find that it is going to copy itself to this location. Now, let's say we make a modification or we compile, we run it again. Well, it's looking to see if it already has persisted. There's already copied itself to this location. So if it has, it's not gonna copy itself again. Then it's going to launch this instance. So all of those changes that you just recompiled, they're, they're not in this version. So if you're making changes and running this program as is, if you compile a new version yourself, I would just suggest to go in here and delete that one, then you can run it because then it'll copy its, its that newly compiled version to the temp directory and execute that. Okay, and uh, one last little tip if you haven't realized this before, uh, but you can quickly navigate to those environment variables such as percent temp percent just by typing that up here in the location bar in Explorer. So let me show you, I'll go to the desktop. We'll do percent temp, percent temp, and there you go, All right? So that's pretty cool. Very similar, we could do app data. Uh, there we go. Okay, so um, that's it. That's our sample program. You can find the binaries on the website and we will analyze this with Process Explorer when we get into the live stream. So I hope to see you then. If you have any questions, feel free to drop those as comments. Until then, keep exploring.